Good evening, everyone, and happy Earth Day. Welcome to Temp Talks 2021. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are really excited that you could all make it. Before we start, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Ombu, and I'm going to be your MC for tonight. I'm in the 11th grade and in my fourth year of STEM. I'm really excited for you to hear about all the incredible projects that we've done this year. So Temp Talks is an annual presentation for our senior STEM students to give them a chance to show off some of the learning they've done for this year. Normally we would have it live, but we're lucky enough to be able to continue it virtually. So we have five presentations lined up for you tonight, covering everything from chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, and technology from our grade 10 to 12 students. Before we start, we have some opening remarks from Templeton's principal, Raz Morani, and the STEM coordinator, Mike Hengeveld. I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Morani. Good evening, Templeton families. My name is Raz Morani, and I'm the principal here at Templeton Secondary School. And uh, on behalf of the staff and the student body of Templeton Secondary, welcome to the 2021 version of Temp Talks. Uh, this has been a, a unique year to say the least, and uh, it's exciting to be able to showcase the work that the students have been able to produce this year. And I think the work that you're going to see this evening is indicative of not just the ability that these students have, but the resilience they have to be able to produce uh, work and to be able to work under the circumstances that they've been asked to work uh, in this most unique of educational years. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening. And again, on behalf of the entire Templeton community, I'd like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Coast Salish peoples. Haichika. Thank you for the kind words, Mr. Rani, and take it away, Mr. Hengeveld. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Hengeveld. I'm the, um, a teacher here in the STEM program and uh, program coordinator for, uh, for what we're doing here. Um, I just wanted some introductory comments just at the beginning of the show here. Uh, the model that we chose a number of years ago was fail fast, fail often. Um, that's based around the idea that if it's worth learning, um, you're going to have to take risks and you know, make mistakes and reflect on that and sort of that's really where growth comes from. Um, this year has been a really odd one as everyone would know. Uh, we were faced with a lot of uncertainty and I think um, if I was to come back to that motto that we've had for all these years, um, I would maybe update it with fail fast, fail often anyways. Uh, because the resilience with which students have um, approached the projects and learning in a, in a really bizarre scenario uh, has worked out really, really well. And uh, I, I've, I couldn't be more pleased, and I think I speak for uh, Carl Janzi as well. Um, so enjoy the evening. Um, I think you'll see that uh, the resilience and, and, uh, and the hard work come out in the presentations. Thank you, Mr. Hengeveld, for those words of encouragement. And I'd just like to take a second to thank both you and Mr. Janzi for being such incredible teachers and helping us so much along the way. We wouldn't be here without you. Uh, now our first presentation is by Jaden and Chris, two grade 11 students who are going to be sharing exactly how project-based learning works and what STEM is all about. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Jaden. And this is our presentation. How does project-based learning work? Project-based learning is a method of education that primarily focuses on student-driven learning where students work on collaborative group projects. Interdisciplinary learning integrates multiple subjects into a single class. Since many subjects taught in school already have overlapping areas of knowledge, mixing these courses together will show students that what they are doing in school has real-world applications, as they will have to apply the knowledge from one course to another. Project-based learning goes hand-in-hand -hand with this, as it is a very effective method of putting courses together in a way that makes sense. For example, a project on building and designing bridges would require torque diagrams, structural analysis, design, and construction, combining science, math, and engineering together. With project-based learning, students will be learning about their courses through the completion of projects, as when dealing with real-world problems, one of the challenges is that no single worksheet or textbook fully fits the job. It takes a great amount of resources, problem solving, and research to make it work. Courses focusing on projects means that students will do a large amount of hands-on work, such as building structures, conducting experiments, and programming robots. From working on projects, students will develop the skills needed to plan out multiple weeks' worth of work ahead of time. Students will also gain a greater understanding of the subjects they are learning, as successful projects require students to apply their knowledge to the work they do. The hands-on approach further allows students to practice and familiarize themselves with skills like soldering and coding. Group-based learning is an integral part to a project-based education system. Being group-based, students will almost always be working with other students for the completion of their projects. 
While many people may think that they are not good at working with others, we propose the idea that collaboration is not a natural skill to most people, but instead is a learned skill that needs to be practiced. With group work, it is common for problems to arise around unequal participation and conflicts in work habits and ideas, such as when one person wants to work after school but their partner wants to work late at night, or perhaps when one person wants to work on a mechanical project but their partner wants to do a coding project. While these are all valid points, we believe that the benefits of collaborative learning far outweigh the disadvantages, as students can work together to achieve better outcomes, build off of each other's ideas, learn to plan and divide up project workloads, and most importantly, gain experience that is effective to them in the real world, as almost every job requires teamwork. Project-based learning is more effective when students have a say in what the projects are. In student-driven learning, students have a degree of choice in how they conduct their projects and what the projects they do are. Uh, a common benefit being that they have more motivation to do this as it plays into their interests. Uh, uh, often this is critiqued as being lacking in rigor, which in our experience is untrue as uh, deadlines still need to be met and a curriculum is still being followed. In addition, we believe that Student choice in project-based learning can aid in preventing burnout and unnecessary stress and can increase motivation as students are able to apply this to their future career goals. STEM is a program that applies all these aspects to create a learning experience in which students can apply their knowledge to other courses and to the real world by merging science, technology, engineering, and math together into a multi-course cohort. Projects in STEM are done in generally two to three member groups over the course of a couple of weeks and requires students to understand multiple different subject areas in order to do well on major assignments and reach their full potential. Throughout the courses, students will learn about science and math as per the usual curriculum, as well as a wide array of knowledge on engineering and technology uh, through building structures using files and other tools, and coding, soldering, and analyzing circuits. In STEM, the grading is based around a list of competencies in different subject areas from general science to physics for the senior grades, mathematics, applied design skills and technologies, or ADST, and CLE for the grades 10s and 12s. For course scheduling, STEM takes up four of the eight blocks that a student has. Under normal circumstances, students will have two STEM classes every day for their year. But with the recent COVID restrictions, STEM takes up two uninterrupted 10-week periods where students can fully focus on their projects. For the both of us, this structure has proven very effective as it has allowed us to focus on our STEM projects without having to divert our attention to other courses. As an example of project work, our most recent capstone project was the construction of a linear accelerator, which at a larger scale could be used in transportation or to launch satellites and other craft into orbit. Linear accelerators use magnetic fields and high amounts of electricity to propel objects. This project used all four aspects of STEM mainly physics and engineering through the design and construction of the device, with a smaller focus on technology and math through circuit analysis and construction of circuits. To summarize, Templeton's STEM program provides a project-based learning environment with emphasis on interdisciplinary classes, first-hand experience in managing projects and conducting experiments, group collaboration, and student-driven learning, granting students knowledge and experience that will be relevant to them in post-secondary education and future careers. We hope you liked our presentation and please enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you, Jaden and Chris, for starting us off for this evening. That was a great presentation. Next, we have Lily, a grade 10 student who is going to be sharing a video presentation she made about a Martian soil simulation project. Take it away, Lily. Hi, I'm Lily Hobbs. I'm in grade 10, and this is my capstone, Life on Mars. Capstones are student choice passion projects that we do every year in STEM. We get more time for them than other projects, so they're a great way to delve into a STEM related topic of your choice while still having support from the teachers. In my project, I simulated Martian regolith and grew radishes in it to see just how possible those potatoes Mark Watney grew in the Martian actually are. As we work to establish long term colonies on Mars, home planet grown food is going to be a very important point. I wanted to explore the possibility of using Mars's own soil to sustain agriculture. There's an abundance of reasons plants need soil to grow, but a big one is the nutrients they get from it. The necessary nutrients are split into two classes, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients 
are needed in large quantities and are the foundations of essential cellular components like nucleic acids and proteins. Micronutrients are needed in smaller quantities and often required as cofactors in enzyme activity. The nutrients plants need are picked up through the roots, so things like soil chemistry and composition affect their intake. pH levels, soil compaction, and water content can also make it harder or easier for plants to absorb the right amount of nutrients. Something really important that is, as far as we know, unique to Earth's soil is the presence of organic matter. Organic matter comes from things like rotting leaves and wildlife, which once fully decomposed turn into humus, which amasses soil particles and contains vital nutrients. Earth's soil also has living organisms in it, like bacteria, algae, fungi, invertebrates, and small burrowing vertebrates. Their secretions process minerals into a state that makes them available to plants, they help decompose organic matter, and they themselves become it when they die. All this is unique to Earth's own soil. Even without these organisms, though, plants grow really well in most soils, as I could tell from the success of my control batch, which grew without any fertilizers. Martian soil, on the other hand, is relatively inhospitable to plants. This is interesting because in theory, it has all the macro and micronutrients required to grow plants. According to data from NASA's Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity rovers, the five most abundant chemicals in Mars's regolith are silicon dioxide, iron oxide, aluminium oxide, magnesium oxide, and calcium oxide. These are all nutrients plants require, but they're just not in the forms that they would be able to absorb them in. Even if there is potassium or iron or whatever it is in the ground, it's not guaranteed the plant will actually be able to absorb the nutrients, a process that's largely facilitated by organic matter and living organisms on Earth. Depending on the area of the planet, there could also be a deficiency in certain nutrients or too high a concentration of others, which would prove toxic to the plants. In my own experiment, for example, both the pure Martian soil batch and the 50-50 Martian and Earth soil batch ended up withering due to a lack of nutrients. This is despite the fact that my simulant was made of those five most abundant chemicals, all of which are some of the nutrients plants need. Notably though, they didn't have any nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. Since the sprouts started withering so early, the radishes I was growing in my Martian soil never actually managed to grow any stalks, but even then, their edibility would have been questionable, what with all the minerals and metals in the simulant. Martian soil has a perchloric concentration of 0.5 to 1% in most areas, which is not a good idea to ingest, as it could lead to thyroid issues and even death. However, we can treat perchlorate in soil. One option is to rinse the soil a couple of times before use, because perchlorate dissolves in water. Another more compelling and efficient method would be using perchlorate-reducing bacteria. There's still a lot of research going into these bacteria, but the hypothesized reduction pathway goes from perchlorate to chlorate to chlorite and finally to chloride and oxygen. Using these bacteria, we would be able to biologically reduce the perchlorate in the soil and get oxygen in return, which is a very inviting prospect. Exploration of multi-use methods like this one is going to be invaluable when working towards maximizing efficiency and well-being on a Martian base. All in all, my experiment went very well, and let me explore a really intriguing topic. My radishes grew similar to what I expected, but still, paired with the research I did, gave me fascinating insights into how plants would grow on Mars. To answer my original question, Mark Watney would have died from the perchlorate concentration, but it may very well be that his potatoes would have grown. With a bit more research, I think realizing agriculture on Mars will be easier than we'd have thought. If I was to expand upon my project, I would simulate lunar regolith and see whether there's much difference between the Martian and lunar soils. I'm also interested in simulating a Martian atmosphere to see how that would affect the plants. 
I loved this capstone because I was given the opportunity to delve into a pretty niche area of science and get credit and support while doing something I was really properly interested in, which is a fun and incentivizing way to learn things. Thank you, Lily, for that amazing video and for showing us the flexibility that we have in STEM as far as choosing our capstone. Next, we have the three musketeers, Sydney, Yasin, and Nathan, who are going to be sharing their capstone project where they restored a wind tunnel and how they were able to work in a group to do so. Hello, my name is Sydney. My name is Nathan. And I'm Yasin. And this is Wind Tunnel 3001. Our project focuses on the AirTech 40 wind tunnel. This is a tunnel using a fan and a specialized chamber to fire wind at high speeds. It's been sitting in the stem room for years, mostly just gathering dust. Without any sensors, it's a glorified fan. Our goal for this project is to outfit it with sensors so we can measure drag coefficients. This is a large project with a lot of different moving parts, so we're really going to have to subdivide and assemble a large team. As Sydney mentioned, this project was very ambitious for a one-month timeline. And in order to be successful in this project and complete all, our, all of our tasks, we had to have good group working strategies and habits. Now, for some people, group work is intimidating. And of course, we all know that scenario where one person does all the work in the group and the other group members don't do anything. This is beneficial for neither side. So to prevent this from happening in our group, we decide to divide the project into a series of smaller tasks uh, with the defined roles for each person, much like swimming lanes. Although we worked independently at times, we also had the ability to help each other out during the project, and this also allowed us to stay engaged with the, the entire project. The main specific tasks we gave each other for the project were building the two sensors, building a mount for the force sensor, and writing the user manual. And all of these tasks were centered around the, the final goal of being able to measure the drag coefficient of any object. So what is a drag coefficient? Well, a drag coefficient is just a number that represents the amount of drag force an object produces in air. In most cases, a lower drag coefficient is optimal, and a drag coefficient can greatly affect the performance of a different body. So how do we calculate this? We're going to need to use something called the drag coefficient equation. This is a pretty large physical equation that I have right here. If uh, I'm going to need to break it down into simple steps for you guys. On one side, you're going to want to insert your variables. Most importantly, the wind speed and force measurements. These are the things we're going to be measuring with our sensors, the most important parts of our design. On the other side, you're going to receive your drag coefficient. Without the wind speed and force measurements, there's no way to get the drag coefficient. So, how are we going to measure wind speed, the problem I was tasked with for the project? Well, the basic solution is to use an anemometer. Basically, it's just a fan that's spun by the wind, and based on how fast it's rotating, you can precisely measure the speed of the wind. This right here is what a basic anemometer may look like. Um, you may have seen one of these before, as they are a typical part of many weather stations. Now that we know what an anemometer does, I can explain how we incorporated one into our project. So the first time we brought out the wind tunnel, we noticed there was an old anemometer hanging from the roof on the inside of the tunnel. We wanted to try to incorporate this specific anemometer into our project, so we began by researching. We researched the model name, the company name, and unfortunately couldn't find anything. The next step to incorporating it was we just began experimenting, and we began this by connecting it to a computer. After much calibration, we were finally able to get readings. Unfortunately, though, these readings were in an unknown unit and did not directly correlate at all to the behavior of the anemometer. So the next best thing we need to do was just to build our own anemometer. So this is the design we came up with. Basically, it's just a motor with a propeller on it, and the way it works is quite simple. Obviously, the way a regular electric motor works is you send power into it and the propeller spins. But the cool thing is that this actually works in reverse. If you spin the propeller manually, the power actually gets sent back in the opposite direction, kind of like a wind turbine. So in our case, we have this motor wired up to a mini computer, and when the wind from the wind tunnel spins the propeller, the power output can be read by the mini computer, and that reading can be converted into a wind speed measurement. Our other missing variable is force. So for that, obviously, we're going to need a force sensor. Our force sensor uses a mini computer and a force measuring device. This device is a small hook on the front, and that hook can measure push or pull. We take a rope, we tie it around the item we're trying to measure, and then attach it to the force sensor. Once placed in the wind tunnel, the wind will blow and it will pull on the force sensor. This force reading is then printed to a visual display that's connected to a mini computer. 
So now, finally, with the ability to measure both missing variables, wind speed and force, we put a toy car into the wind tunnel and plugged each missing variable into the right side of the equation. We then were able to get the drag coefficient of the toy car, and our results went very well. Um, the toy car's drag coefficient compared very nicely to the drag coefficient you would get with a real car. We were only 0.1 off, and we believe this is most likely due to the abnormal shape of the car when compared to a real car. Uh, one of the larger tasks that we completed in this project was the user manual, user manual of which I completed myself. It includes the system specifics, technical diagrams, how to use the system in a step-by-step -step process, compatible data collection softwares, specifications of the system, such as its limitations, the physics of drag coefficients, and our calibration experiment, which included testing the drag coefficient of many different objects. In this project, maintaining strong collaborative skills was incredibly important. We used a Google Drive to keep track and share files. We had a team group chat to discuss our plans. And every day, we'd come in and talk about the goals for the day and how we could help each other. For example, one time, Yassine needed help calibrating his sensors. So I took a break from my thing to help him brainstorm possible ways to do this. Instead of focusing solely on our own goals, we would work to achieve our larger goals so we could move more quickly and effectively complete the project. So where is the group where we like to go from here? Well, we hoped that we could use our new refurbished wind tunnel to measure the drag coefficients of different prototype vehicles, then hopefully use that data to design our own prototype car that had an optimal aerodynamic efficiency. It's clear that we probably won't end up in the wind tunnel business in the future. However, this project wasn't solely about that. The way we came together collaboratively and negotiated specific individual goals for each person was very good practice for the types of situations we'd be put in in the future in our own respective occupations. The collaborative strategies we used throughout the project are something the STEM program has given us the chance to develop over the years, and they are a skill that we will be able to keep for the rest of our lives. And lastly, I'm going to leave you with this quote from Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. Thanks for watching our presentation. Thank you so much, Sydney, Yassine, and Nathan for showing us how to work well in a group and divide up workload. Next, we have one of our grade 12 students, Amelie, who is going to be sharing her water testing capstone project, where she was able to learn locally and use her STEM skills out in the field. Hi, my name is Emily Hornberg. I am in grade 12 STEM, and today I will be talking about local learning and how that pertains to my capstone project of testing the waters of Still Creek to see how the pollution levels change in different areas of it. The hypothesis that my partner, my lab and I were working off of was that runoff from industry and other projects would introduce possible contaminants and that levels would increase as you head downstream. We measured the water quality along Still Creek and its potential effect on wildlife and habitat restoration. We tested for 16 different contaminants shown here on the screen. Ultimately, there was no consistent trend in any of the contaminants. The levels varied throughout the length of Still Creek. The only consistent change was in pH, which decreased steadily in a downstream direction towards Burnaby Lake. The conclusion that we reached from this data is that the contamination level changes aren't from natural causes, but from man-made ones, such as storm drains, construction, railways, businesses, garbage, and others. Of all the things to study, why this? We had wanted to do a more environmentally focused project. The city of Vancouver had started a project to uncover the creek in 2002 in an effort to bring back the wildlife and the salmon. We wanted to see if the water was as nice and clean as they had wanted. I am going into environmental sciences and we thought that this would be a good starting point for that. We also wanted something local that is easier to research and relate to than say how climate change is affecting trees. We thought that this would be a fun project and it was something that we could do and continue outside the classroom. You might be wondering, why is this relevant? Well, Vancouver went through all the trouble of uncovering Still Creek in 2002 after 80 years to bring back the wildlife and the salmon. But there can't be wildlife if the water quality is bad. The chart that is shown on screen is lead. Lead is measured in milligrams per liter. Other than three instances, we measured the lead content to be at 12, 20 milligrams per liter. When consuming water, there shouldn't be any lead in it. When we were collecting samples, we saw very few aquatic animals. There were, of course, the typical birds you see around Vancouver, but we only saw fish on one day and in just one spot. We saw mallard ducks, wood ducks, and Canadian geese. One mem memorable time, we even saw a blue heron. 
I really enjoyed this project because we were able to take what we learned in this project and apply it in our local environment. Local learning is like field trips, but on a much grander scale. We take what we have learned and apply it in our projects, either generally like coding or more local and focused, such as in this project. This way we get to experience the real world, see what works and what doesn't. For example, in this project, we had to learn on the fly how to collect samples on a rainy day and not have the rain affect our samples after we had taken them. A big reason for collecting our own data is that until going out and experiencing something ourselves, we have no frame of reference, no idea what the numbers mean and correlate to. There may also be hidden things that wouldn't be noticed otherwise, such as the fact that we did end up seeing fish on one day, ducks, geese, and a heron on the last day. We were also able to see the surrounding environment and pull conclusions for that. Why were the cyanuric acid levels so high at our fourth testing site? Maybe it was because there was a big pile up of garbage in the stream 10 steps down. Another reason is that we couldn't find any accessible data online. On the first day though, we saw some students from Langara College doing the same project. They started in December. Through this project, we learned how to gather data from various sites in a variety of conditions. We learned how to make an interactive graph displaying all the data we collected in a way that makes sense and were able to filter it without having to make 30 different charts. We had learned the theory of this in class at different times. However, this was the first time that we were really able to learn it, put it into practice, and see what actually worked. I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to get out of the classroom and get some hands-on experience. Continuing onward, we would like to eventually petition the city to clean and better take care of Steel Creek. To do this, though, we would like to do more extensive testing, both in regards to more testing and more things to test for, such as E. coli and other bacteria. We would also like to try and figure out what causes the different levels of contamination, given that they change oddly. Thank you for watching. I hope you liked my presentation and enjoyed the other presentations as well. Thank you, Amelie, for that incredible video. Next, we have a grade 10 student, Caleb, who's going to be sharing his Hacking Google Home technology-based project, where he's going to share how he came up with a solution to a real-world problem. Hi, my name is Caleb Dornian, and I'm in grade 10, currently working hard in the STEM program. And I have one question for you. What if you could control your home from your bed? Well. I made a large step towards that goal this year with my capstone project. This year, I programmed, built, and coded voice-activated curtains. The idea behind this project was that I would have a Google Home talk to a Wi-Fi module. This setup would check for a specific phrase to be said, and once that phrase was said, would send on-off signals from the Wi-Fi module. I then decided to hook these signals up to motors, which acted as spools for a piece of string that could shift the string back and forth, which could open and close my curtains. After some very tiring weeks and a tremendous amount of troubleshooting, I finally got my project to work. Here's a video of it working. Okay, this is Caleb Dornian, voice activated curtains, attempt number seven. Hey Google, close the curtains. This project started off with only an idea and a passion, yet it ended in a major success. Now you may think, that's cool, or fun project, and yes it was very fun, but I encourage you to think about the real world applications that this could have in the future. Systems like these could allow ease of access for things that the average human may take for granted. A more specific example of this is someone with a disability. Let's say, for example, person one broke their leg and had to stay in a wheelchair and they couldn't reach up and hit a light switch, but they still had a way to communicate, they could have a voice activated system do it for them. Just think about this for a moment. We can improve the quality of life for so many people through systems like these. Now, systems like these could also be helpful for us in ways we may not think about. Like, let's say for example, you're at work and you forgot to turn your lights off, or you're cooking and you need to see the next instruction, but your hands are messy. With one simple button or phrase, we could solve all these problems without a second thought. Some more specific things that I learned during this project were how devices across the world talk to each other, 
how DC motors work with positive and negative charges, as well as how to bridge the gap from the outside world to local devices. This project had many different aspects. There was the technology part with the Google Home and the Wi-Fi module. There was the engineering part with building the framework for the curtains. And there was the math part with getting all the coding to line up with the motor shaft and its speed and length. I say that I incorporated three out of four of the main aspects of STEM into my project. And if I hadn't thought and accounted for all of these, I guarantee you my project would have failed. This is one of the things that I like the most about STEM, is that you can't really have one thing without the other, much like the real world. In STEM, we incorporate many different aspects into all our projects. Much like in the real world, problems that arise are rarely just one thing or another, and learning to think and account for everything is a very important skill. The second thing that I like about STEM is the knowledge that we learn, we then take and apply it to real-world scenarios through projects. And finally, group work. In STEM, we do a lot of group work. Now, for some people, this may be a very scary thing, but this actually may be one of the most valuable skills you can learn. You learn to work with people and have good social skills. You learn to navigate through unknown territory. But you also learn to ask for help and steer to the answers you're looking for. This is a large part of how I overcame many of my roadblocks. I asked for help from school friends to teachers all the way to distant family members. And in the end, without the help, I wouldn't have completed my project. One of the main things I want you to take away from this project, though, is that you don't need to be a genius, know everything, or especially know how to code to join STEM. If you have an idea, a passion, or fire of curiosity, no matter what, STEM is for you. I started with a passion, yet no idea how to work with any of these aspects outside of simple use. Yet, my project was a huge success, I'd say. This year had many wonderful experiences, and I learned a lot. I also accomplished a lot that I was proud of. I faced many challenges, yet having overcome these challenges, I improved all the skill sets I set out to work on. And if I could go back and do it all again, I would, without a doubt. Thank you all very much for your time, and I hope my project was interesting to you. Now that wraps up Tem Talks 2021. Thank you again to everyone for being here and taking the time out of your evening. We really appreciate it. I'd just like to give a quick shout out to Carl Janzi and Jacob McConnell for doing all the behind the scenes work and making this video happen. Um, now in this presentation, you were only able to see about five projects, but we do have another 30 or 40. So if you'd like to see the rest of them, you can click the link below this video and you will see a gallery where you can see different projects of all different focuses. Thank you so much and have a great evening.